In 2018, the iconic Time magazine published a list of 25 moments from American history that shaped the modern world. Now, in a list like this, you would expect to see big moments like from the Civil War, meeting of world leaders, the moon landing, etc. But if you go all the way down to number 24 on that list, you see a rather strange moment from history listed there. It's a Supreme Court case about a bacteria created by an Indian scientist. But you see, this wasn't an ordinary court case. Whether a living organism is patentable subject it was a legal battle that led to one of the most controversial decisions made by the US Supreme Court. It was in this case that they decided that human beings should be allowed to patent living organisms. That like a TV or a phone or a fridge, life itself can be patented. This one decision blurred the lines between God and human and gave birth to a billion dollar industry that we now call biotechnology. It's the reason why we have genetically engineered crops, life-saving drugs like insulin, and many modern cancer treatments. But it also opened a door that many scientists believe should have remained shut. This is the story of a legal battle that shaped the world that you live in today. From your food to your medicines, everything was influenced by this one decision. And at the center of all of this was one soft-spoken Indian scientist from West Bengal who just wanted to save the planet. Today, I want to tell you that story. My name is Tirthak Saha and you are watching Under the Radar. This is a series that was made possible by the Zero One Network by Zero Dha. Our story starts in January 1969. A few miles off the coast of Santa Barbara, California, an oil rig called Platform A blew up. Over the next 10 days, 4 million gallons of crude oil spilled out into the Pacific Ocean. Beaches turned black, thousands of birds died. Dead birds along the shore, victims of the oil spill, became a very usual sight. Dolphins washed up on the shore covered in oil. It was the largest oil spill in American history at the time. The world watched in horror as cleanup crews tried to contain the damage but failed. Everything possible is being done to save the beaches. These disturbing images from Santa Barbara sparked a worldwide environmental movement. Remember celebrating Earth Day back in school? It was started a year after this oil spill. And people were furious because here's the thing about oil spills. Once the oil is in the water, there's almost nothing you can do. I mean, you could try to isolate and contain it using physical barriers, but actually cleaning it up? Nearly impossible. Well, unless you found something that heats up the oil and converts it into something harmless. You see, around this time, a young Indian scientist was working in a lab in New York thinking about how to solve this exact problem. Ananda Mohan Chakraborty was born in 1938 in a small town in West Bengal in India. He was the youngest of seven children in a typical middle-class family and had a typical middle-class upbringing. He studied at St. Xavier's College in Calcutta, got his PhD from Calcutta University in 1965 and then moved to America to do research. And by 1971, he was conducting research at General Electric's R&D lab in New York. And his job? Well, it wasn't really glamorous. GE initially had him working on how to convert cow manure into cattle feed. But Chakraborty had a secret side project that he worked on during evenings and weekends. He was studying a type of bacteria called Pseudomonas. You see, some strains of this bacteria had a very interesting property. They could break down the chemicals in oil. But the problem was that there was no strain of this bacteria found in nature that could break down all of the components of crude oil. One type could break down one chemical while another breaks down a different chemical. But oil spills contain dozens of types of hydrocarbons all mixed together. And so Chakraborty had an idea. What if he could artificially combine all of these different abilities into one super organism? One that nature can't produce, but maybe humans can. One that could eat away the oil and clean up our sins. 
Here's where the story gets scientifically wild. Dr. Chakraborty figured out that the oil-eating abilities of these bacteria wasn't stored in their main DNA. They were stored in small circular DNA molecules called plasmids. You can think of these plasmids as hard drives or SD cards that have some information stored on them that can be transferred from device to device, or in this case, from organism to organism. And so basically what Chakraborty did was he took the plasmids from different strains of this bacteria and combined them into one. He took the plasmids that lets one bacteria eat octane, another that breaks down camphor, another for naphthalene, another for salicylate. And then he combined all four into one organism. And the result was a completely new bacterium that did not exist before. A kind of superbug that could eat two-thirds of all the hydrocarbons found in a typical oil spill. And it could do it much faster than any natural process could. He called it a multi-plasmid hydrocarbon degrading pseudomonas. It's a mouthful, yes. Scientists would later shorten the name to Pseudomonas putida. And General Electric was super excited about their employees' new invention because they saw the potential for this to be a real money maker for them. And so, in 1972, they asked Chakraborty to file a patent, a decision that would lead to the legal showdown of the decade. Dr. Chakraborty's patent application had three parts. First, the method he used to create the bacteria. Second, a way to deliver the bacteria to the oil spills. And third, the bacteria itself. The US Patent Office approved the first two, but rejected the third. Sidney Diamond, the US Commissioner of Patents, was extremely opposed to allowing this patent and his reason was simple. He said, you cannot patent a living thing. Nature creates life, humans don't own it. End of story. But Chakraborty argued something different. His bacteria didn't exist in nature. Nature didn't create it, he did from scratch. According to him, it was as much a human invention as a TV or a radio or a fridge. Now, Diamond wouldn't back down, so Chakraborty filed a case. We'll hear arguments next in Diamond, Commissioner of uh, Patents against uh, Chakrabarty the legal showdown that would change the world we all live in. At first, the case bounced around in lower courts, but in 1980, the Supreme Court finally agreed to hear it. And the question they had to answer was whether a living organism is patentable subject matter under Section 101. And after months of hearing on June 16th, 1980, the Supreme Court announced its decision. Out of the nine Supreme Court justices, four agreed with Sidney Diamond, but five agreed with Chakraborty. He had won. And what had convinced them was the actual language of the Patent Act. It says you can patent any human-made manufacture or composition of matter. And Chakraborty's bacteria fit both definitions. It was manufactured by human effort and it was a new composition of matter that did not exist before. And then the Chief Justice, Warren Berger, summarized the entire case with a line that has now become famous. He said, patent law covers anything under the sun made by man. The bacteria was man-made and therefore patentable living or not. The four judges who had disagreed warned about dangerous doors being opened and monsters being let out. They were worried about the commercialization of life. But the other five judges said, that's not our problem, that's not our job. If the government wants to stop patenting living things, they can change the law. Our job is to interpret the law as it is written down right now. And with that one decision, the world changed forever. Within a few years of this decision, companies started patenting everything from genetically modified seeds to cancer-fighting proteins and a new multi-billion dollar industry called biotechnology was born. Now let me show you both sides of the coin. Some scientists say that this was necessary. They say that without patent protection, big companies would not have invested billions of dollars into cutting-edge research and developing new medicine and crops. It has produced new innovations like genetically modified corn and soybean which use less pesticide and water but produce 20 to 30 percent more. The life-saving insulin uses genetically engineered bacteria. Even the research that made COVID vaccines possible can be traced back to this. So this seems like a great outcome right? Well, not everyone agrees. Remember what the four judges who disagreed with this ruling said, that it would open some doors and let out some monsters? Well, a lot of people agree with them today. Take seeds for example. Before this ruling, farmers could save some seeds from their current harvest and plant them next year. This is something farmers have been doing for thousands of years. But once seeds could be patented, that changed. Today, if you buy seeds from a big corporation, you have to sign an agreement that says you won't save them for next year. You have to buy new seeds from them every single year, like a seed subscription model. 
An American company called Monsanto is infamous for this. They have filed over 140 lawsuits against farmers for violating these agreements. Some farmers were even sued when the wind accidentally blew some patented Monsanto seeds from a neighboring farm onto their land. And it affected us in India as well. Earlier, India's patent laws did not allow for patents on life. But in the early 2000s, the US started pressurizing India at the World Trade Organization, even challenging us legally. And finally, India was forced to amend its patent laws, allowing for modified seeds. Guess who showed up to India immediately after this, trying to monopolize the seed market? Guess who forced millions of farmers into debt because they just couldn't escape this subscription model. Yep, the food for the entire planet is controlled by just four companies. Then there's the case of human genes. In the years after Diamond vs Chakraborty, companies started patenting sequences of human DNA. One company called Myriad Genetics patented the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. These genes are linked to breast cancer. After that, women who wanted to find out if they were carrying these mutations and were at risk of cancer had to pay thousands of dollars for tests, for information about their own bodies. It only stopped after another US Supreme Court case in 2013, which ruled that human genes cannot be patented. And then there's the whole thing about biopiracy, when mega corporations try to patent traditional medicine and knowledge and food that people, typically of developing nations, have known about and used for thousands of years. We actually did a full video on it and you should definitely watch that. They even tried to patent turmeric and basmati rice from India. So was the judgment passed in Diamond vs Chakraborty the right one? Depends on who you ask. Diamond vs Chakraborty did answer the question of can you patent life by just saying yes. But we didn't answer a second, more important question. Should you patent life? One scientist, one bacteria, one iconic court case. And 45 years later, we're still trying to figure that one out.